One of my biggest regrets is dropping behind the neck press for my shoulder training. As many OGs will remember, I used to live on this exercise, performing it on the weekly, maxing out, doing it for high volume, never had any shoulder discomfort. Yet, I believed the lie of one influencer who managed to convince everyone that shoulder impingement will occur. This will be the destruction of your rotator cuffs. And so I revised my paid programs, which included the behind the neck press, removed it, worked with my clients to eliminate this dangerous exercise. And I scrapped it for years, quite literally eight years. Time flies. This would go on not only in myself, but the entire industry because the wave was massive. We're all swept under it. What I describe as being fear mongered into oblivion until new data came out. And although I am not a physiotherapist, I can refer you to modern ones that will repeat the exact same things that I'm saying. First of all, the shoulder impingement theory has been debunked. It might not even be a real thing. This was part of an old school curriculum. And now if you go to school to become a physiotherapist, they're giving you new recommendations. It's like if I started to become a psychologist and I was using the DSM-4 instead of the DSM-5, obviously there's gonna be some revisions, right? Well, guess what? A lot of these influencers who basically told you that you were gonna get shoulder cancer from doing behind the neck pressing and overhead pressing and upright rows and wide grip pressing and flaring and all this fucking nonsense, they're living off the old curriculum because they're older. They're either in their late 40s or 50s or even beyond that point. And they have not updated their stats still regurgitating the same garbage from decades ago. So how about I just refer you to a channel called E3 Rehab to learn the truth about this. And I'm gonna put in a clip right here and you can find out for yourself if what I'm saying makes sense. Unlike Jeff, I update my beliefs based on emerging research and this theory has been debunked for years now. It's important to ask ourselves, how do I know what I know? I knew shoulder impingement was a valid and useful diagnosis because it was taught to me by my professors in physical therapy school. And my professors knew it was a valid and useful diagnosis because someone taught it to them. And that goes back at least 50 years. It's the same reason surgeons have been performing the subacromial decompression surgery or personal trainers advise against upright rows. Certain clinicians have actually been pushing back against the diagnosis of shoulder impingement for over a decade, but it's hard to change 50 years of medical history that we think we know to be true. However, enough research has surfaced since that time to question the usefulness of shoulder impingement as a diagnosis. If symptoms were solely caused by compression of these overlying structures, we'd expect their removal to improve symptoms and function. However, research demonstrates that subacromial decompression is no better than placebo surgery. Four, subacromial decompression also doesn't seem to change the long-term prevalence of rotator cuff tears. Five, compression of tissues in the subacromial space is common, occurs equally in people with and without symptoms, and happens with normal day-to-day -day tasks. Six, a smaller subacromial space is not correlated with symptoms or disability. Why does any of this matter? Not only is the diagnosis of shoulder impingement unhelpful, it can be harmful. The most important thing for reducing shoulder injuries on overhead pressing, on behind neck pressing, on any exercise known to man, is accounting for load management and tissue capacity, meaning we need to strengthen those joint angles over time with appropriate weights, such that we don't develop overuse injuries and our tissues can slowly adapt in these deep stretched out positions or what can be described as awkward. And also that by going through deeper ranges of motion, we actually develop mobility. So people will say you should avoid going past 90 degrees, you're actually making the problem worse. Because one day, if you do decide to press low, that's when you will snap your shit up because now using that same overloading weight in the riskiest position that is untrained. So therefore, to eliminate injuries, it's actually the opposite of what you've been taught. You want to strengthen weak positions such that when you enter them, they're no longer problematic. And this is what happens with behind the neck presses. It's similar to a regular overhead press, but the movement pattern is 100% vertical. Not only from a torso angle perspective, but even the bar path itself. Even when using a barbell, it's like the Smith machine. Straight up and down. So you know when you lock out a weight on a regular OHP? You're over here, right? Well, when you lower it, you're now in front of the body. So what you actually have is a J curve similar to a bench press. But when you're behind the neck, not only are you starting up here, but you're ending in that same spot. So there's not all that horizontal travel. So that changes the moment arms. Not only that, but the elbow positioning itself will also differ because if the starting position is in front of the body, like in a regular OHP, now the elbows are pointing this way. Whereas if I'm behind the neck, they're actually 
pointing to the walls on the side. You're in a more abducted position, which we can argue has muscle biasing implications, specifically the side deltoids. And yes, all overhead pressing works to side delts, but the more vertical, the better. This is why when you go one stop down seated, that's an anterior delt press because proportionally speaking, you're getting a little bit more emphasis there. Still hitting the side, but not as much. This is why traditionally we've mixed in seated and standing, but it can also be achieved through regular overhead press and behind the neck, right? And it hits more of the upper back muscles. Since there's a lot of movement going on with the scapula and how tight you gotta be. Those mostly gonna be a mobility thing and strengthening the delts while the elbows are completely flared out because that does feel different. This is why old school bodybuilders loved it so damn much. Standing and seated. This is what I recommend you do. Mix in both. You know, if you're gonna stand up, I recommend starting with the push press. You go as if it's a squat, explode, and then you begin. And I specifically recommend going all the way down. This is how you build tissue capacity. A lot of guys will say, oh, behind the neck press is safe if you stop at 90 degrees. Who invented that rule? Show me the evidence that that's to your benefit. Actually, I would say it's the opposite. You want to stretch your delts to the maximum, which if you turn around, it's going to be to your damn neck, behind the neck. And don't just tap here either, because some guys will manipulate their head movement so that they're doing a partial rep, yet it's still standardized. The trick is to keep the arms way back, and you'll find that if you actually go down in that perfect path, you will end up very low. Similar to a high bar squat in terms of the end placement. Basically, the way you unracked it is how you should end up at the end of the negative. And in fact, this is not even the physiological limit of what's possible because you are using a straight bar. If you were to use a buffalo bar, now you can get a couple more inches of range of motion, but that's gonna half your strength, quite literally. But you can argue it's even better for the delts. Or you can bring the arm even farther back and actually touch your lower traps. But for that, you have to cock the wrist all the way back or even let it hang in your fingertips and use a very wide grip. So there's ways around this, but the point is we can enter all of these deep positions without prompts. And I just want you to think about this logically. If you're able to do squats with 500 pounds, yes, that is a realistic, natural number. We actually have Natty's doing 700 pound squats now, just to say, and you're tight and you're here, right? Especially low bar, which we know was hard on the shoulders. If you can sustain at least five times the load in that position, then what the hell is a press from there? It shouldn't really be a problem. The bottom is the least of your concern. If you ask me, if you're actually being tight in your back and you will see it. When I'm doing behind neck presses, it almost looks like a fucking back workout. You can expect the same. In terms of getting into these positions, cause I expose that it's perfectly safe. And actually I've been doing this for the last three months. Not a single strain, not a single problem. It feels perfect, exactly the same as all the other overhead pressing I've been doing for the last 10 fucking years. Okay, we know it's good. How do you train it so that you don't get snapped up? Because there always is a little bit more risk, right? Okay, what you do is micro load. Yes, you're not too good for it. That is also what I did because the fear still lingers in the back of your mind. I know I can't fully convince you. Therefore, start with the empty bar. Don't tell me that you don't have the mobility to touch your neck with 45 pounds. Are you really that weak? Don't bullshit me. Unless you're a complete novice in which I'll give you some leeway. There's no excuse. It's like saying, oh, my lower back hurts from good morning. Did you try the empty bar? Ah, you don't want to because it drops your ego, right? Well, get used to it because behind the neck press, that's exactly what's gonna happen. So you're gonna start with nothing. Stick to higher reps of let's say, 10 to 20, but even 15 is a really good endpoint. So you don't have too much fatigue and refine that movement pattern, build some tissue capacity. And from there on, you are going to add five pounds every time you can do the upper end of your rep range. So let's say you're doing two sets of 15. Once you can do 15, 15, up the weight by five pounds. Or if it just feels too easy in general, up it, but no more than five. The lowest possible addition you can imagine. And what you'll find is that it's gonna take some time to get back to your original overhead pressing numbers, but you will get there because the delt strength is there. All we're doing is training in a submaximal fashion. So I would actually do this in addition to your normal overhead press training. Don't drop it because then you risk getting weaker. This can even be a low volume approach. You do two or three sets of regular overhead press or the AD press, and then you finish with one to two sets of behind the neck. Again, with the lightest possible load. 
increase ever so slightly until you regain your original numbers. And what you'll find is your shoulders will have adapted to this extreme range of motion, these deep positions. All of a sudden, you got 135 and above, no discomfort, which is where you should have been all this time. And that's actually where I was years back. In 2016, I did a 185 behind the neck press and everything was fine. Now, I'm pretty sure I could do that again. Although I would say this, behind neck pressing allows you to get more out of less weight. Now you might be thinking, well, didn't you just say that you're going to reclaim your original overhead pressing numbers? And to that, I would say yes, but you're still getting more out of that weight because the repetitions will significantly drop. So if you can do 10 reps on a standing OHP, you might get four to five tops with a behind the neck press. And the reason is quite simple. It removes all chest involvement. So for anyone who's had some pec strains or you feel under recovered in that region, or in general, you wanna compare the ratios of your pure pec strength versus your delts, this is probably the best way to do it. Because as I pointed out earlier, with the regular overhead press, you can lean back and therefore involve the upper chest musculature. And it changes the leverages to make it a lot easier. It's like doing a high incline press. Well, with this, it's basically impossible. It's always going to be upright and you will always feel your delts to the max. And then we can argue there's a bit more range of motion in the bottom if you're actually touching the base of your neck. Although it feels different because the arms are flared out. Like when you're tucked and going low, it almost seems like you're stretching less. I guess it's just more awkward to press in that way. Or maybe I've been doing tuck presses for so long that <laughs> this feels harder by comparison. But I do know that you guys will struggle to the point where 135 is probably the heaviest weight you'll need. I mean, you could go heavier if you want. Surely in a low rep range, 185, 200 pounds, we have seen this in the past, but the regular behind neck press, seated or standing, you'll actually find that the weights are essentially interchangeable. It doesn't make much of a difference because they're not unstable to begin with. It's actually very stable given the straight elevator motion and the torso angle doesn't differ. So that's one of the benefits of going seated on a regular overhead press. It locks in the torso angle, right? Well, behind neck, again, seated or standing, it still locks it in. And even if you try to manipulate otherwise, it won't affect your leverages in a positive way. It's strict in the pure sense. So if you get strong, it's almost impossible to have small delts, including the side, by the way. Out of all the shoulder pressing variations you could do, this is by far the most biased towards the side delts. And I do want to mention that in the bronze and silver era, this was the number one mass builder for the side delts. In fact, when Vince Gironda came around, it was considered unconventional at the time to do side raises. He was the contrarian saying that bodybuilders can get better delts by doing a ton of laterals. And he had his unique variations for that, right? But the majority of the greats built their delts with heavy ass overhead pressing. Many variations, of course, regular standing, seated behind the neck with dumbbells, all that. So we can't just say it was the behind the neck, but it certainly was a staple. And I would venture to say that if you're doing this in addition to the chest expander, you're gonna have 3D delts. It's to the point where I even dropped side raises once again. I seem to always flip flop on this topic. Like on one end, I know that it's optimal that I include it, but at the same time, it's like, I can get away with not doing it. And you see the delts, no pump. They were quite amazing when I was shredded. I would say, 90% of these shoulder gains were developed through pressing. And then the rear, definitely some isolation work and rows. But remember, everything I talked about regarding injury prevention applies to many other exercises that you've been afraid of. I can tell you that whenever I get away from extreme fear mongering and I go back to what the old school grades were doing, my muscles and joints seem to thank me. Instead of causing injuries, it seems to reverse or prevent them. So a little something for you to consider. But yes, my current position is that behind neck pressing is safe and effective. You don't need as much weight. It's better for the side delts. It's a badass time proven variation that everyone can build massive delts from. So that's it. Let me know your feedback in the comment section. Do you have experience with behind neck work? Are you currently doing it? Did you drop it because you were also afraid? What's your position? Let me know. I'll talk to you all next time.